Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 101, Enhance Your Hockey Freakiness, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we push our chips to the middle of the table, go all in and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and you want to schedule an in-person, off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Today, we're going to get our freak on, learn how to enhance our hockey freakiness, and just get to the bare bones of it. Dictionary.com says freak is any abnormal phenomenon or product or unusual object. It continues to say it's a person or animal on exhibition as an example of a strange deviation from nature, as well as a sudden and apparently causeless change or turn of events, the mind, etc., an apparently capricious notion, occurrence, etc. Example. That kind of sudden storm is a freak. Apple Dictionary has similar definitions of freak, such as a very unusual and unexpected event or situation, and a person regarded as strange because of their unusual appearance or behavior. I think we all have used a variation of the word freak when retelling a story with a little flair. An example for me, I was home alone. The storm thunder was getting louder and closer with every boom. I was freaking out. <laughs> but the idea for this podcast came from this Apple Dictionary definition variation that identifies the person who knows their why and are uncommon on how they go about obtaining it. Here's Apple's definition. A person who is obsessed with or unusually enthusiastic about a specific interest. A person who is obsessed with or unusually enthusiastic about a specific interest. What person or who do you see in your mind? Is it a sports figure, actor, online influencer, a political activist, or a successful business pioneer? Let me read it again to you. A person who is obsessed with or unusually enthusiastic about a specific interest. Are some of you out there saying, Coach, that's me? I hope so, because everyone deserves to experience what it feels like chasing a dream, accomplishing a long-term objective or goal. The rest of this episode will be dedicated to being different, to swimming upstream once in a while. Why? Because we can and we like the challenge. Some may say it's freakish. It's all about going to bed at the same time every night getting up before the rest of the world when ultra-discipline is needed. If you want results that will freak people out, let's learn from some freaks that were freaking out people before freaking out people was a thing. <laughs> Love that. Now, I'm not an expert on freakiness, but there are many out there that have made becoming exceptional, becoming freakishly good at something, their life's work, and have written books regarding their findings. Books have been an inspiration for me over the years, and I'd like to share with you some titles and quotes that have guided me in the past to accomplish more today than I did yesterday. I'll put the links to each of the books in the description if there's something that really resonated with you and you wanted to pick up a copy of your own. With that being said, let's begin. Book number one, The Freak Factor, Discovering Uniqueness by Flaunting Weakness, by David Rendell. The term freak can mean manic, fanatic, 
something unusual, irregular, or abnormally formed, an eccentric or nonconformist person, or a person who is obsessed with something. In this book, I define a freak as a person who is unique because of a natural, positive obsession. I use the word as a compliment. The goal of this book is to help you discover and enhance your natural freakiness. I don't think any of us are, or were, normal, and most of us don't have to go to the trouble of making ourselves into freaks. We just came that way. I'd like to help you make yourself into a bigger freak than you already are. As Marcus Buckingham says in his book, First Break All the Rules, don't try to put in what was left out, try to draw out what was left in. This sediment is echoed by Tom Rath of the Gallup Organization. He believes you can't be anything you want to be, but you can be more of what you are. That really sums up the purpose of this book, to help you become more of who you are so you can help others do the same. End quote. Quote number two, the seven strategies for finding your freak factor. My unlikely transformation illustrates the seven strategies for finding your freak factor. Number one, awareness. Identify your strengths and weaknesses. Number two, acceptance. Stop trying to fix your weaknesses. Number three, appreciation. Embrace your unique characteristics. Number four, amplification. Flaunt your weaknesses. Number five, alignment. Find the right fit. Number six, avoidance. Move out of situations that highlight your weaknesses. And number seven, affiliation. Partner with people who are strong where you are weak. End quote. Quote number three, freaky amplification. Jimmy Kimmel is a comedian and the host of the late night talk show, Jimmy Kimmel Live. Because of his success, he was asked to host the White House Correspondence Dinner. At one point during the event, Kimmel walked up to the podium and said, I also want to thank Mr. Mills, my high school history teacher, who told me that I'd never amount to anything if I didn't stop screwing around in class. Mr. Mills, I'm about to high-five the President of the United States of America. Then he stepped over and high-fived Barack Obama. When Kimmel came back to the podium, he said, Eat it, Mr. Mills. I'm not going to criticize Mr. Mills. He believed, as many people do, that school success is essential for success in life. He was trying to give Kimmel helpful advice, but let's look at how Kimmel actually succeeded. He didn't stop screwing around. He went pro. He got sillier, more ridiculous, more childish, and more immature. He started screwing around for a living. He went further in the direction that Mr. Mills told him not to go. Kimmel amplified his weakness, and that is when he found success. End quote. Quote number four, the four P's of alignment. There are four elements of finding the right fit. The first is passion. What do you love? What energizes and inspires you? The second is proficiency. What are your skills? Where do you excel? The third is payment. How can you get compensated for activities that combine your passion with proficiency? How can you make a living doing what you love? The final component is purpose. How can you make a difference? How can you make a positive contribution? It is possible to design a meaningful and fulfilling career that includes all of these elements, but the sequence of the four elements is important. Most people address them in the wrong order. They start with payment. How can I make the most money? Then they move to proficiency. Can I do it? This is followed by passion. Can I tolerate the job requirements? Finally, some consider the question of purpose. Will this activity harm? Unfortunately, this approach usually leads to frustration and failure. Passion comes first. End quote. And bonus quote number five. Limitations are good. All this talk of avoidance can seem quite limiting. However, limitations can actually help us succeed. Barry Schwartz, in his book The Paradox of Choice, 
explains that when we have too many choices, we struggle to make decisions. He encourages us to learn to love constraints because as the number of choices we face increases, freedom of choice becomes tyranny of choice. Routine decisions take so much time and attention that it becomes difficult to get through the day. In circumstances like this, we should learn to view limits on the possibilities that we face as liberating, not constraining. Surprisingly, more options don't liberate us, they paralyze us. As Rich Fromm explained in Escape from Freedom, people are beset not by a lack of opportunity, but by a dizzying abundance of it. It is counterintuitive, but limitations, not options, are what liberate us. End quote. Book number two, The Achievement Habit. Stop wishing, start doing, and take command of your life. By Bernard Roth. Quote number one. By the end of this book, as a reader, you will understand why trying is not good enough and how it is very difficult from doing. Why excuses, even legitimate ones, are self-defeating. How to change your self-image into one of a doer and achiever and why this is important. How subtle language changes can resolve existential dilemmas and also barriers to action. How to build resiliency by reinforcing what you do, your action, rather than what you accomplish so you can easily recover from temporary setbacks. How to train yourself to ignore distractions that prevent you from achieving your goals. How to be open to learning from your own experience and that of others. This book will open your eyes to the power you have to change your life for the better. It will give you confidence to finally do things you have always wanted to do while ridding yourself of issues that stand in the way of your full potential. And the experience of taking control of your life will change your reality, making it possible to achieve almost anything you seriously want to do. End quote. Quote number two. What is achievement? In my mind, and for the purposes of this book, I define achievement as having a good life, getting the job of living done in a satisfying way that nurtures the life force within us and within those we associate with. It entails developing some self-mastery to handle the difficult aspects of our lives and relationships. It involves finding something to do with our lives that engages us and gives us positive feedback. If we're doing it right, life shouldn't be a debilitating struggle, even if at times it takes considerable effort. End quote. Quote number three, design thinking. Design thinking is an amorphous concept that was given its name by David Kelly another Stanford professor and co-founder of IDEO, when he was trying to explain that successful designers have a different mindset and approach from most people. We all adopted and adapted it at D school, and the idea took off like a shot. Suddenly, everyone was talking about this new concept, design thinking, something I'd been practicing for half a century without having a proper name for it. It's difficult to give an exact definition for design thinking, however, but because I'm one of its inventors, I can certainly give you an idea of the principles which we'll get into throughout this book. Number one, empathize. This is where it starts. When you design, you're not primarily doing it for yourself, you're doing it with other people's needs and desires in mind. Whether you're designing a better roller coaster or a better hospital waiting room experience, the idea is to care about the user's experiences and figure out how to help. In this step, you're learning what the issues are. Number two, define the problem. Narrow down which problem you're going to solve or which question you're going to answer. Number three, ideate. Generate possible solutions using any means you like brainstorming, mind mapping, sketching on napkins, however you work best. Number four, prototype. Without going crazy to make anything perfect or even close to it, build your project in physical form or develop the plans for what you're going to enact. And finally, number five, test and get feedback. 
In fact, he tells us, one of the most important concepts of design thinking is that failure can be a valuable part of the process. The only thing to fear is fear itself, said Franklin D. Roosevelt, and I say the only thing to fear is not learning from your mistakes. You can fail lots of times as long as you learn from these failures and figure a solution out in the end. End quote. Quote number four, flip the switch. Whenever anyone makes an important change, it's because a switch has been flipped. Someone who has struggled her whole life with her weight finally decides to get fit. Someone who has put up with an abusive boss for years finally has enough and quits. Someone who has harbored a secret crush finally takes the plunge and asks her beloved out for coffee. A shift has happened that has made action favorable to inaction. You can sit around in the dark, waiting for the light to come on, or you can get up, walk across the room, and flip the switch yourself. End quote. Bonus quote number five. Odds, failures, and predicting your life. Statistics show you trends. They can't predict your life. Likewise, consider that the odds have always been against greatness. If one were to decide on a career path just by the odds of financial success, we would have no movie stars, authors, poets, or musicians. The odds of any one person becoming a professional, self-supporting musician are very low, and yet you turn on the radio and you hear hundreds of them. The odds were against the Beatles, Elvis, and the Grateful Dead too. They could have been scientific about the whole thing and chosen more reasonable career paths. And what a loss for the world that would have been. If you succeed, the odds then are meaningless. Any path may have a 2% success rate, yet if you're in that 2%, there's a 100% chance of success for you. The long shots are often the most rewarding. As Bernie tells us, without exception, people who have done great things have also experienced great failures. End quote. Bonus quote number six, the final countdown. Imagine you only have 10 minutes to live. What would you do? Imagine you only had 10 days to live. What would you do? Imagine you only have 10 months to live. What would you do? Imagine you only have 10 years to live. What would you do? Imagine you only have the rest of your life to live. What would you do? Looking at your answers to these questions, you have a lot of information about yourself. In this exercise, we are talking about your end game. Can you think of any changes you would like to design into your self-image? Start designing and changing. None of the friends I just told you about knew when they would enter the final countdown. I don't know when mine will come, and you don't know yours either. One thing for sure, it is closer today than it was yesterday, and it will be closer still tomorrow. So now is the time to develop into the person you want to be. End quote. And bonus quote number seven. Being the cause in the matter. Being the cause in the matter means taking full responsibility for whatever you're dealing with and whatever happens in your life, even when it seems that things are not totally in your control. It's a declaration of choice. Instead of playing the role of passive protagonist in your life, choose to take charge of your future. Resolve to get things done, whatever it takes, and no matter how many valid reasons pop up. End quote. And book number three, The Big Picture, 11 Laws That Will Change Your Life, by Tony Horton. Quote number one, will this book change your life? The information within these pages changed mine. My hope is that you'll gain some benefit from this hard-won knowledge too. Give me a few hours of your time and I'll tell you everything I know to help you become stronger, healthier, happier, and better in every way. And we're not just going to look at how to change your body. We're going to look at how to shift your attitude, excel at the things you love and even the things you don't, and improve your relationships with friends, family, and world at large. We're going to look at how you can make your life better by connecting all of these dots and looking at the big picture. End quote. Quote number two, the 11 laws. Law 1. Do your best and forget the rest. Law 2. Find your purpose. Law 3. 
have a plan. Law four, variety is the spice of dot 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 everything. Law five, consistency reigns supreme. Law six, crank up the intensity. Law seven, love it or leave it. Law eight, get real. Law nine, find a balance. Law ten, stay flexible. And law eleven, the three R's: recharge, recover, relax. End quote. Quote number three: Do your best and forget the rest. Then came Don Miguel Ruiz's "The Four Agreements," a quick read containing, you guessed it, four simple rules for living an excellent life. The fourth agreement particularly impressed me: Do your best. Ruiz's point is that if you do the best job you can every time, no one, including yourself, can fault you for not trying. I thought this was incredibly wise. At the same time, I felt incomplete. For me, at least, it didn't clear away the static clouding my brain left behind by life's haters, the naysayers, and the football coaches. So I added something that made it sing for me: Do your best and forget the rest. Do your best means showing up and doing your best without being attached to the outcome. It means reality is not something you can manipulate. Forget the rest means you don't let the same things that used to get in your way get in your way. It took years of trial and error, seminars and books, auditions, and yes, odd jobs to put these two things together. Hopefully, this chapter makes that connection a little easier for you. End quote. Quote number four: Find your intrinsic purpose. Here's a hint to help you get started. Your purpose probably has something to do with having a better life. For many people, the first purpose that comes to mind has to do with money, vanity, reputation, or material stuff. Forget about that garbage. It's all smoke and mirrors. Looking good in a bathing suit is a nice feeling. And driving a fancy car is fun, and having people think you're cool is flattering. But the thrill of those things subsides in a nanosecond, and you're left with nowhere to go. And besides, when those kinds of goals are your main focus, it becomes destructive. You lose perspective. Maybe you wake up one day and decide there's no such thing as too skinny, and you start treating your body in unhealthy ways. Or you stop caring about your financial commitments in pursuit of the latest thing. And end up in a pile of credit card debt. No matter how you slice it, a shallow purpose isn't going to get you from point A to point B. It gets you from point A to point A and one tenth. End quote. Bonus quote number five: Failure, the new awesome. There's nothing wrong with failing. In fact, failure needs a new name. Failure should be renamed awesome. Everyone loves awesome. Most folks think of failure as the opposite of success, but I beg to differ. It's like what Winston Churchill said: "Success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm." Failure and success are Siamese twins; they don't exist without each other. There's no way around it. The problem with the word failure is that it connotes that you're a loser. And losers don't succeed, or win, or get the girl, or guy, or pie, or pot of gold, or whatever it is you want to get. As a result, many people would rather play it safe, not take chances, not explore, and never ever stick their neck out and actually try. End quote. Bonus quote number six: Flexitarianism. Back in my twenties, if you asked me what I plan to eat for each day, I responded, "What you got?" Today, I'm a little pickier, because I'm a flexitarian, meaning I have a largely plant-based diet with the occasional organic, sustainable animal protein. It varies, with the exception of the fact that 90% of my food choices are clean, no processed stuff, and healthy. I talk the talk, I walk the walk, I eat the eat. You know what I mean. End quote. Bonus quote number seven: the voice of consistency. Sometimes the biggest obstacle to consistency has nothing to do with external factors. 
Some days, you just don't feel like you have what it takes to do what you need to do. Do it anyway. I don't care how you do it. I don't care if it's ugly. I don't care if you do it hard or slow. I don't care if you do it with a fox or if you do it in a box, in a house or with a mouse. Just get it done. End quote. Bonus quote number eight. Functional optimism. So when obstacles show up, it's important to recognize the need to deal with them realistically, with a plan, but one that is born from a positive mindset. I call this functional optimism, and it's a key component of achieving your big picture goals. It's not about knowing everything can work out. It's about knowing that everything will work out because you're going to do whatever you need to do to make it happen. End quote. And bonus quote number nine. Life is about living. Life is about living. When you know this, you become the ultimate motivator. It's not just about surviving anymore. It's about thriving and showing the people in your life how to thrive. Get out there, have a blast, and help friends, family members, co-workers, and your community to make the most out of their lives. That, in a nutshell, is the big picture. End quote. Pure awesomeness, don't you think? If you've never heard of Tony Horton, who was our last author, he's known professionally as a personal trainer, author, and former actor. I feel like I know the guy because he's known globally as the creator of the commercial home fitness program called P90X. When my kids got to the age for the introduction of fitness and weight training, my wife was in charge of that, so she got the P90X DVD program with Tony Horton guiding my boys early in that process. Thank you, Tony Horton. It was enjoyable reading about your journey to the top of the mountain. Highly recommend this book. Did a particular book or quote resonate with you? For me, it came from book number two, quote number one, and it's going to get another quick reread before we wrap this up. Book number two, The Achievement Habit. Stop wishing, start doing, and Take Command of Your Life by Bernard Roth. Quote number one. By the end of the book, as a reader, you will understand why trying is not good enough and how it is very different from doing. Why excuses, even legitimate ones, are self-defeating. How to change your self-image into one of a doer and achiever and why this is important. How subtle language changes can resolve existential dilemmas and are also barriers to action. How to build resiliency by reinforcing what you do, your action, rather than what you accomplish so you can easily recover from temporary setbacks. How to train yourself to ignore distractions that prevent you from achieving your goals. How to be open to learning from your own experience and that of others. This book will open your eyes to the power you have to change your life for the better. It will give you confidence to finally do things you have always wanted to do while ridding yourself of issues that stand in the way of your full potential. And the experience of taking control of your life will change reality, making it possible to achieve almost anything you seriously want to do. End quote. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed this segment on how to enhance your hockey freakiness. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon and do me a favor. Make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.